six deep. <laughs> I haven't left the house in four days because it's like minus stupid here. <laughs> and I'm watching a 60-year-old jump a, a dirt bike into a canyon with a backpack. Like what a, did you think? You wasted your life. Backpack. Well, no, it just it it does make you feel like a bit of a loser, right? No. And that's saying something because Tom Cruise is maybe the biggest loser in show business. Really? Scientology. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Like yeah, if you ask me who I hurt. who I hate but I can't hate cuz his movies are still so fucking good, Tom Cruise. Really? Yeah. Can't stand him. He's a cult member. Dude, he's fucking in charge of a cult, one of America's biggest cults. He's it's not like at the top level of that yeah, cult. Yeah, he's like too Mr. Scientology. So yeah. like I don't I don't I don't like you I don't look at him and go, you? Mm, I wish I was Tom Cruise. I look at what he does and goes, and I like I said to myself with that ramp video, we'll get into it in just a second. Yeah. I'm like, that guy's fucking unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. I hate his guts, but he's unbelievable. So they tell you, and I just found out about this uh, when somebody uh, died of cancer, but they tell you that if you reach the top rung of Scientology, that you can't die from cancer. They actually tell true. them that. That's not true. Wow. They tell them that. That's like Danielle Smith level crazy. <laughs> no, they <laughs> tell you that in Scientology. They, they tell you. And it was the, the she was in Cheers. Remember the one that was always Christy doing Alley. the weight loss stuff? Yeah, she, you know what she just died of? Cancer. Colon cancer. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Act full of bullshit. Yeah, it's not true. Anyway, you're right. So that that's why you stayed up and got hammered all night last night. Is it because you felt bad about your life because Tom Cruise's video looks so. Impressive? No, no, I was just. <laughs> I, ironically, weird. I was just yeah. watching the video Erotic. for hours. Like, what did you did no, you did you? Watch I was it for drunk 10 hours when I was drink? watching the video. It had nothing to do. I didn't start watching the video and then go. <laughs> Or I didn't, you know, start drinking you when start, I started watching the video. But did you start feeling bad about yourself when you were watching it? Is no, that why you kept I drinking? affected by this? I don't have that button. Like, I don't have that. Like, I'm not <laughs> one of those guys. I'm, I'm generally, uh, I'm usually, I'm, I'm pretty decent at shaking off. Start crying? Go up no, to Deb and I, go, I don't know I why I'm not like I'm a Tom failure. Cruise. I'm just not. I'm a failure. I did realize, it did become apparent to me yeah. that when... Like when you're six beers in, you haven't left the house, right? And I'm sitting at my computer in the loft watching a video of a 16 year old man, a 60 year old man jumping a canyon. Like it, it was like I'm sitting there with my Bud Light going, What am I doing? <laughs> well, let's bring in a guy who. Enjoying your stupid life. Let's bring in a guy who understands that. Uh, and he's in Edmonton as well. And he knows a thing or two about making movies. Because films, he's 60. No, he's not. Adam Scorgy, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Award-winning hey. documentarian. Scorgy. Scorge. How are you doing, guys? Scorgy. Uh, let's just get to this Tom Cruise thing before we knock it off. Do you identify with what Lachlan's saying? Like, do you sit there at night, get hammered-ass drunk, looking at Tom Cruise, jumping things, going, I've ruined my life. Well, not quite like, I, not quite like Lock, but I have to say, when I watched that, and then I yeah. did the backstory on it, you know, as a filmmaker, I was like, holy fuck, I could do more because Locke, do you know that he did that stunt six times on a bike in order to get it right? Yeah. So he rode up a fucking jump six times over a cliff and parachuted. He did he did 13,000 jumps on dirt bikes over the last two years and something, some crazy amount of skydives, like a thousand skydives or something. Yeah. Get it right. It does make you kind of be like, holy shit, I could do more. When I'm too lazy to go to the gym, get your fucking yeah. ass to the gym. When I'm too, like, when you hear about, you know, like, and and yes, yeah. Tom Cruise's connection to the church and Scientology and stuff, that is all batshit crazy. If you want, you want to watch a good documentary on it, though, how they kind of loop you in there. Going called, clear. Uh, going clear. Fine right. Out they, yeah, yeah. The confessions, they actually yeah. record them all so that when you're there and you're in your most vulnerable moment, sharing your soul, thinking you're connecting with a deity, they actually record it, use it against you if you ever try to leave. So, uh, <laughs> you know what? If I had a call, I might do that too, actually. Or it's like, no, don't worry about it. You're just confessing your sins to to the Lord. That's all you're doing. And then you <laughs> secretly record it and you're like, by the way, if you if you ever choose to leave, we're going to play all that for somebody. <laughs> right? Yeah, we're going to we're going to extort you and. Uh, <laughs> 
So yeah, it is, but it does make you like it is like the guy's a goddamn superhero to do this shit. Yeah. Like, like, like are you kidding me? Six times? Well, okay. So look at this. So you're you're a filmmaker, uh, award winning uh, documentarian. You film things, record things, set things up. I mean, like you understand what goes into like an an AD, uh, all the other stuff, construction of this kind of stuff. But like, what goes into first of all, like as a, as a filmmaker, and you see someone doing that. That's Tom Cruise, sixty years old, multi 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 millionaire. Sure, he's a Scientologist, but whatever. It's got to blow your mind that he has like no interest in self preservation whatsoever at, the, at this age. Like, yeah, it's just fucking bizarre. Physically, like, say what you want. Like, look at, man, like, you saw him in the, the latest movie. Like, you know, he produced that. That was his baby. Put it, it, it crushed records. It did good. It, it kind of yeah. simplified things, I think, that you're seeing in a lot of like the woke culture coming in movies now. Like, he kind of just went, like, you notice that they never really say where the bad guy was or who they're fighting. They're just like, yeah. well, there's these Megs. Like, they just, because they know nowadays it's so politically correct that even if you said Russia, who you know is currently at war, you probably have you'd alienate half your audience. So they're like they just make it the bad guys with mm -hmm. you know Mach Five Megs and make it. But it's a great film. I took my kids. It it played the nostalgia part I wanted from like loving Iceman and this stuff back in the day. But it it also had like a great like you know we watch an IMAX and they're turning in the the jets like and you could feel them struggling and huffing like i remember my kids are actually going like this in the theater it's amazing how how much work and stuff they put into that i i know how hard it is and everybody thinks like getting the studio films is easier it's harder i couldn't imagine getting that kind of money it's hard for me to get a million or two for my docs like to put it all together so much is based on financial success it's always yeah. forget, like it is a business so you can make whatever you think is the best movie possible but if it doesn't make money then the business failed and people yeah. don't want to knock, right? Like I they, made my daughters watch top top gun, the original one. Yeah. And, and I thought this is good. We were, we, they were back during COVID. So we would pick movies on Friday nights and we'd all get to rotate. And, and we found out through, you know, conversation at the dinner table that they had never seen top gun. I'm like, what? Come on. I failed. I failed as a father. If you guys haven't watched top gun, so we're going to watch that. And, um, they were laughing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i i remember being really cut, like, uh, mildly offended but then i realized oh it is it's really kitschy like it's yeah, like my it's daughter, old old cheesy movie shit my yes, kids did the same thing when i'm like have you guys seen yeah. the original star wars like the first one that came out in 78 and they're like no and i'm like you got to see it it's incredible so we start watching it and the scene where they're in the garbage and they're trying to fucking stop the garbage thing from closing in on them um, it was like everything was shaking and jiggling yeah. and there was you could yeah. tell it was styrofoam and i'm like and they're they're laughing they're like dying mm -hmm. laughing i was offended i'm like how dare you laugh at this, this yeah, they almost died laugh. okay like they, <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, i know then, that's the same, all this all the stuff we grew up on is like that's the same with like i you know i'm a big the action guy that's why we're doing dolph lundgren's documentary but i love the original masters of the universe and like you watch that now and people are like yeah eh, this is ridiculous and i was this like really guy cheesy. running around in his underwear and stuff like that right but it, like <laughs> For me as a kid, I remember I, I I watched a cartoon. I had all the 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 figurines, and then when you first saw Dolph in that first scene in Mash of the Universe, I was like, "Holy fuck! That's that's the real that's him. That's that's what I envisioned He Man would look like." Yeah. Right. So it's it's it it, it 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 certain films don't stand the test of time, but it it's interesting to see how big of an impact those had because interesting now, kind of full circle, producing Michael Bisbing's documentary is that he was super inspired by the Rocky movies, right? He, he's like, he thought that those movies, those fictional movies encapsulated like what it was like to be a professional and championship fighter so well that even once he became a champion and went through injuries and went through struggles, he's like, man, the Rocky movies, he's like, it actually is what made him, brought him to tears and made him kind of reconnect after Dan Henderson and knocked him out. Um, cause he said that like the, when Rocky's the one scene, he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm just so cold. I can't stop my hands from shaking and my thoughts aren't working. Bisping was like, dude, that was a way ahead of it. That's what I felt. Right. And he's like, it made me break down. So he's like, it's weird how fiction can inspire reality. Cause Bisping then became a world champion, much like Rocky, but even better. He did it with one eye and no depth perception, right? Like he, yeah. he accomplished a bigger feat than beating the unbreakable Russian. Right. So like I, circle, I, I, though, I for for just quickly, I just yeah, the yeah, Top yeah. Gun. My daughters watched the Top Gun. I've talked to them since the Maverick, and they loved it. They've yeah. gone like my oldest has gone to see it a couple of times in the theaters. So, God, so I mean, well done. 
Yeah, it it yeah. You can hit on Tom Cruise. The new movie is fucking awesome. There's no. It is. Problem. It yeah. really yeah. is. He has. There's something about it. his I, his touch. I right. Your thing, Dean. I yeah, just, thanks, I buddy. Can't. No, no, I hate that I loved it, and and yeah. I hate that I'm looking forward to the new Mission Impossible. Yep. I hate that I love oh, that I entire to. fucking series. I hate it. And, 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 and I hate Tom hate, Brady, and, and I like I can't stop how watching. Fucking, how good does Tom Cruise look for his age? He looks Unreal. fucking fantastic. That pisses me off too. Yeah. He's yeah. for that, right off, that hair piece. Yeah. That hair piece even holds out when he's jumping out of planes. <laughs> hey, so, yeah. And say what you want, hair piece, whatever, whatever. Yeah. You can't take away like when they do the beach scene, and he's yeah. like almost as in good a shape as the twenty-year-old guys. You're kind of like motherfucker. I can yeah. that. You well, son he's, of a bitch. He's on the horse. Come on. You think so? I think he's on roids. Do you ah, think he's on the Winstrol V? Well, here, like yeah. So interesting, interesting you guys talk about. So because I just went, um, actually, I went to a testosterone replacement therapy place here in Edmonton. Uh, cause thinking I'm 42 and I, I've, I, you know, obviously worked with a ton of these guys that have done it. And Joe Rogan talks about it lots and looks spectacular for his age. So I was like, well, you know what? I'll go get a blood test and see, cause I'm not feeling I've, I've noticed in the last five years, like I certainly don't have that oomph in the gym anymore. That, that real, like, I don't feel the pump. I don't feel strong anymore. So I went in and didn't get the assessment I wanted. The doctor's like, I don't think you're going to be on the low end of testosterone. Just seeing the way that you make eye contact and you could you wink at him when he told you. Did you go? That, that's right. <laughs> no, that's right. I will, hey, I'll play any angle. If he helps me hook me up on the program. Yeah, right. Tucker like, Carlson says all you got to do is suntan your balls. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Is that, yeah. is that it? And yeah, yeah you got to go outside, do a handstand with no pants on. Like in July, you'll feel great and hang out with like a lot of other naked men in saunas, apparently, according to the video <laughs> right. that we watched. See, yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah. that would lower or my testosterone You'd personally, think. but hey, every, everybody's their own. <laughs> you think <laughs> it's hey, everybody's to their own thing. You know but they call that the yeah, they call that they call that version of like the steam bath with other dude therapy. They call that the Travolta. I don't know if you know that, but it's true. <laughs> I did not know that. But yeah, I'm, no I'm, I'm glad I come to this podcast to learn new things like that. Thank you. We're here for you. Yeah, you're but it, yeah. interesting. What I wanted to bring up about the appointment, which was fascinating to me, I didn't know, is he said, "Look, Adam, he's like, we get you on testosterone replacement." And you'll probably notice a benefit, but it won't be like we can get you to optimum levels, like maybe your mid to late twenties. And I was like, "Yeah, like that sounds great." I was. Did, did you do this for a dinger? Did you do huh? this so you could supplement the dingers? The... Are you doing it for the thing? No, I, I, that, I'm not trying to sound like here. That was one of the things that gave me minus points again testosterone because he said, "Do you still get morning woods? Do you still get?" And I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "Are they as like strong as when you're in your twenties?" I'm like, "Well, clearly no. Whose are? Like I'm in my forties, so no." But he's like, eh, he's like, most guys I deal with come in and like, don't get them anymore. So that's why they're going. I'm like, well, uh, uh, if I'm being honest, right. And they do blood tests and everything. But he said, look, here's, and here's what I want to bring up going back. To I would have lied. I would have yeah. lied. I is that no, I, I need it. Well, this is what's scary about it. So if you do it, he goes, look, Adam, we, could, I can carry we, the could, groceries in. Yeah. we, we could get you on it and it, you know, maybe get you up to optimum levels and you'd feel, you know, a pump in the gym and you'd feel better. But he's like, the problem is, is like, then your natural testosterone and everything might shut down permanently and then you'd oh. have to be on this forever oh shit! So, so he said that is the pros he's like when you get into your mid 40s late 50s and you do testosterone replacement therapy and even some people feel great but he's like but then i can't get them off he's like then you're doing a couple shots a week forever and he's like in the long-term effects don't show like any negative effects other than your endocrine system, like if you're getting an outside source, your body tries to accommodate and say, oh, if I'm already getting whatever the levels are, I don't need it. So your testicles will shrink and your body will stop producing. So he said, Adam, if I could get you to optimum levels and your energy will probably feel better and you'll feel great in the gym, you'll, he's like, but there's a chance your natural system will shut down and then you're seeing me permanently, right? So He's like, that is a risk you have to consider. Also, and I, was like, I didn't know that. That's that's too bad because I, I would I would have totally shysted myself big time. Well, I was ready like, to I go. Said, I was yeah, like, give okay, it to, give it to try me. It. And, you know, <laughs> I actually thought the guy. I, he did a great job because he also asked. He's like, look, Adam, looks like you were like, did you do steroids and stuff when you were younger? I'm like, nope, I've never messed with my testosterone levels and stuff before. He's like, that's good because if you've played with it before, there's a really good chance you'll shut it down now, right? If it had had. So it, they, they do a good, and you go for it. He said, well, look, go get a blood test. And then once you get a blood test, we can kind of see what your levels are. Right now, I'm just guessing by what you've told me. But until I actually see all your creatine levels, your kidney levels, and monitor all that stuff, I don't know for sure. So mm. 
that was what, you know, when I first hearing about testosterone replacement, I, I was like, oh, I'm not going to do it. But the fact that they do, you know, quarterly blood tests to make sure everything's good and they're checking your kidneys and, and stuff like that. I was like, oh, well, that's not. So, so you can I, sort of see it in guys' face that are doing stuff. Like I, I've well, always thought that about hormone. Rogan. Yeah. If you do, yeah. well, there's different. If you take testosterone replacement, right? That's, but if yeah, you Rogan take, looks cro magnon. Like he looks yeah, Neanderthal. Yeah, protruding at this point. forehead thing. Going. Yeah. You, you know who else? Take, yeah. You know who else looks like they're doing something is Tiger. Did you see him in the match? Yeah, with his kid. Yeah, dad. Yeah, he's he looks he looks like uh, he's on the juice or something. Too. He looks yeah. like he's doing something because his in that interview that they had at Puffy. the match where he did with Rory, he had that that kind of that that look in his face. And um, yeah, I'm just wondering if what what he was on. So you're saying that's different? I thought it was just testosterone. From what this guy explained to me, what I was educated, that's again, I've never taken any of these things, but if you uh, is that that's HGH, human growth hormone, yeah, that yeah. still affects your skulls and your bone density. And you know, again, if you and Rogan's talked about taking that, yeah. And if you're older, and you, you know, like they they're showing that this is really great if you're in your mid to late fifties or sixties, like because you lose a lot of bone density and it's tough to keep muscle mass and stay strong that they they recommend small dosages but the problem is is you know you have to go do it properly with doctors and blood tests and make sure you're taking accurate levels and not i knew lots of guys that were taking all that shit when I, they were in their 20s right to become mass monsters yeah 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 well, and you're a former underwear model too, which let's get into that real quick. Um, you never did that, but look at so you got a couple documentaries out, Mr. Underwear Model. Adam Scorgey joins us, uh, and and let's get to this one where you you brought back like that that old pose of old. You're doing the Tutu documentary. This is you, Jordan Tutu, and the crew. I'm excited about this one, dude. I really, really am because Jordan Tutu has like just his fucking amazing life story. Life story. It's not yeah. just about alcoholism and isolation and being in, I mean, there are so many tentacles to the Jordan Tutu story. How did this come about? Talk about that for a sec. Yeah. So the Jordan Tutu one's uh, an interesting one that uh, again, you, you hit the nail on the head. It is, it is a fascinating story of like, we've been up to Rankin with him a few times. And when you go up to Rankin Inlet in Nunavut, you're like, how did you ever make the NHL? Like, how did this, like, they don't even have paved roads up there. Right. It's all dirt roads. And, uh, you know, and then his brother died by suicide and, and the drinking yeah. and the, the culture up there. It's amazing that he, he, um, was able to be, and he is, he's the first Inuk to ever make the NHL and to ever play for team Canada. Um, and, and it, 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 that one is like life changing for us. Cause we actually went on the land with him for three days. And I don't mean in Rankin where there's hotels and stuff. Like we took a snowmobile, uh, with the, what he calls their Inuk limousine and we took it three, four hours into the middle of nowhere. And they had these tiny little cabins. Finally, they're like, oh, that's where we're staying. And then we were, you know, we stayed in a cabin with him looking at the night sky and stuff for, uh, we were three days out in the Arctic. I wish I could send you guys photos, but incredible. It was so nice to have no, uh, you know, no cell phone service, nothing out there. But this all came to be that our director and I, we were saw it like, cause Tutu's book is a national, Stephen Brunt did his book. Who's done a lot of hockey players and everything. He, um, he done Tutu's book and it was a national bestseller. Yeah, dude, low key. One of the best writers on the planet too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Great He's essays. Like, yeah. Amazing, amazing writer. Uh, they're actually doing a second book because the first one was so successful and everybody was reading his story and was like, man, like they're like, Adam, you should do Tutu's doc. Like his book is incredible. So we reached out to Jordan and he'd had a lot of people approach him about doing it. Right. And he's like, ah, I don't know if I'm ready. There's four or five of these proposals on my desk. And, and then our director, I said, well, look, I've got there. I have at least know where to go now. And I've got his ear. So Michael Hamilton, that's who's on my left in that photo or the photos far right uh, was he wrote a piece and just said, you know, I said, write your director's vision and how you see doing it. And I'll send it to him. And, and sure enough, Tutu said, out of all the things I've ever been sent, that sent me right home to exactly how I was feeling when I'd be coming on the flight down from Rankin Inlet, returning from playing down south. He's like, okay, I'll, I'll take a chance and I'll meet with you guys. So then we 
we met in person and we hit it off. And obviously Tutu was a big fan of Ice Guardians and he'd seen the Grand Fear documentary. And then he'd called, he he actually went into rehab, both him and um, Brian McGratton are, you know, they're, they're, they're in recovery. They've been sober for over a decade. They're good buddies and played together in Nashville. And I worked with Brian McGratton. He's one of our main guys in Ice Guardians. And he gave us a glowing review and was like, oh yeah, these guys are awesome. They're who you want to tell the story. So then he he ultimately chose us, which was good because the way the networks are going right now is they had a big issue with us. They didn't like that uh, we were not from none of it to be able to tell the story. They were, I won't say what network, but one network basically told me like, I'm not allowed to tell the story because I'm white. Uh, and I said, but my director's black. And they're like, yeah, but you're not indigenous, so you can't produce it. And I was like, I was like, but Tutu chose us. So like, it really shouldn't matter what the color of any of our skin is. If he chose us, that's who he thinks would represent the story best. Um, but that's, that's the way the industry so probably right shouldn't say that it was CBC on the podcast. On, on a live <laughs> podcast. <laughs> hey. uh, yeah, it's a good chance. And there's only five yeah. major pillars of broadcast in Canada. So yeah, yeah. yeah. We well, we'll try not to, I'll try not to. I won't it. say anything about CBC. And Locke won't yeah. say anything about CBC. Ryan, and you? Then we won't. Definitely not going to no, talk about No, we're quiet, yeah. dude. We're not we'll, saying a fucking word. We're, help, no, we're here I, for you. I'm dude. glad you guys keep it a secret. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's interesting, though, you know, because uh, that, that lends itself, even just a story, right, lends itself to you got a, a dude who's just got this fabulous life story who works with uh, Inuit uh, kids, people. I mean, he, he's just as charitable as it comes at this point in his life because he's so grateful for the life he has. And he's been through so much, whether it's abuse, the suicide of his brother, uh, alcoholism, uh, all those things that come together. But you made a, racism a, a, racism. Yeah. 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 I mean, you, you know, what is it that you're going to what are you going to focus on? Like, are, are you going to, are, what is the main purpose of this? Cause we, we talked about doing a documentary, which we'll get to in just a second. Yeah. And, and you talk about how you go into a documentary with, this is the story we're going to tell. And then you got to be flexible because during the documentary, other stuff comes up. Right. So, uh, what are you doing? What's the focus with Jordan Tutu? Well, that's a, that's a great point. Cause actually it shifted big time. Our directors like, uh, Michael Hamilton was like, Adam, he's like, originally, this was a cool story about a guy that had played in the NHL and accomplished some amazing feats. But Tutu has actually used this as a way because he's like, I've never really, you know, connected or really, really uh, felt my way of what happened. Because he's like, when my brother died, he's like, everything happened so quickly. Like he got drafted and went to the NHL in his pro career. He's like, this has really helped me because he's like, I kind of blacked out a lot of things going through this process of like, oh, right, that's what happened. Oh, my God, I didn't realize those details and mm -hmm. all this other stuff. So it's been a, a healing and learning process for him, too. Right. And we've all been going through it together. So it's a it, it, it's really going to just focus on, you know, the underdog story of a guy that, you know, can reach great heights but then still have a rock bottom with alcohol and everything was about to take everything away right but then thankfully to to identify it enough that he's like i need to get sober i need to get clean i need to do this for my family and for every i need to be better and now you know like you said he's a huge advocate and spokesman for this now and speaks all over at indigenous schools and communities so that's really the angle we're talking is that it's a, this triumph over tragedy story of a guy that like you know, should not have had success. You know, we all think like, oh, well, I don't have the same that he had or this like, and yes, you have to have, you know, you can come from very humble be beginnings like Jordan, right? But you have to have a good moral compass. Like, you know, all, despite there was problems in the household, Jordan still has a very loving and supportive father and a very loving and supportive mother, right? Although there was alcohol and other things involved in there, but that you can overcome these. And even when it seems like the world is taken away from you, like with his brother's death, like to understand him and Terrence, they they were almost like, like they were different ages, but they were almost like twins and inseparable. And Jordan got into hockey because of Terrence, right? And to go into some detail that we discovered about Terrence's death, which is in the book is like, he really, you know, wanted to get it done because there was three shells left in the billets house, three shotgun shells that were in the tool shed. And the first one, he went out to the back and he dropped it and didn't, didn't go into the shotgun. Second one he put in and it was one in a million shots. He pulled the trigger. It didn't engage. 
So he took it out, Jesus. put the third shot in, and then got it done. Wow. So clearly he He's wanted – he made his – yeah. Yeah. He made his decision and we went right back there with Jordan. We went right back to the house that, Jesus. you know, yeah. And, and but Jordan is and he was okay with that. Like he was capable yeah. of like saying, yeah, well, let's tell the story. No, he wants like, because that's always a great thing when you deal with somebody that's been through recovery, right. Is that they understand about going to those hard places, right. Cause that's how they got sober. They had to find what those hard things were that you know why why they have so, so much pain or trauma or whatever is making them become an addict so they usually are the one they they love like talking about it in the therapy and going through that helps them so jordan wanted to go through it and it was an awkward it was an interesting situation when you talk about how the story molds like originally when we you know read the book and went through this we knew all this but we we never knew if we were going to get that access or if that was all going to come through and jordan was like yeah nothing's off the table i'll talk about my drinking i'll talk about you know uh, you know when i was partying too much in the nhl he's like i won't obviously throw anybody else under the bus but he's like i'll talk about everything i did i've talked about it in therapy a lot right so i'm not scared to talk about it and that always makes a great doc when you honesty nowadays like something we've seen with kind of all new vulnerability it's like connective tissue for people right, right? well and and kind of like you know even like look at where, where podcasts like yours and stuff are are and all podcasts now, people are going here more than regular news because all news is bullshit now. All news, right? It's just yeah. clickbait. It's hate clicks. It's what gets you engaged. And so, you know, when you have truth and vulnerability in a doc, that's why docs, it's the golden age because people are like, man, at least this doc has some moments of truth, right? Because mm -hmm. everything else seems to be bullshit or marketing or hidden logos or agendas, right? So that's, I think that's why we're in this golden age of docs, right? Is people are like, oh, I'm going to watch something, a true story, a refreshing yeah. story. That, they want something yeah. unfiltered. That's why podcasts yeah. are so big. Sorry, Locke. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, same, you want to I, I just, yeah. I, I will. I, I, I'm going to make this quick. I promise. I, I want to jump in because I, I, I got a text from a friend of mine, um, Al, Indian yeah. Al, who I affectionately refer to him as. And he um, listened to the podcast that we did yesterday, last night, and texted me this morning. And we got into the homeless situation in Winnipeg specifically. Yeah. Um, and the indigenous population and um, and um, making their way down to Winnipeg and it being a real problem. And he said, you know what, Locke, he said, you're still my favorite settler, but you needed to mention that a lot of the uh, homeless situation is still um, has to do with the residential school systems and the abuse. And, and it, it is still running through that community. And um, and he said, I wish you would have mentioned that. Um, when you were talking about that. So I, I'm correcting that situation now. And thank you for sending me a note, Al. Um, and and you know what? I think that Jordan Tuto's story right now is even more important. I would agree. Um, and, and I think, you know, based that, on what he did and what he accomplished with the struggles that he went through, right? Well, and, and he's discovering because his dad, right, is from Churchill area originally. And he went through the residential schools and stuff too. And he said, he's tried to get this stuff out in Barney's his dad's name. And, you know, he's like, Oh, there's so many times we're out on the land and I want to talk to him and, and get it. I can just see behind his eyes that there's this trauma and this pain, but he's like, I go right back to my inner childhood. And I'm just like, Hey dad, let's go fishing. Like, he's like, I don't know how to, he's like, it's weird. Oh, even when you become adults and you're on an equal playing field, how we have that, you know, the way that we idolize our father. You become a kid that. again when you're, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah uh, I, I said that to my kids. Yeah. They, they, my parents came to town the other day and they were like, uh, just here for a couple of days of Christmas. And my son's like, you act like a kid when your parents are here. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's because I am when I'm here. Yeah. I mean, they're my kid. But no, back to the, the Jordan stuff. Is Does he get to talk about that part? Like the familial systemic um, yeah, he's going to go into all like, again, he did that like lot residential of that, schools, you know, all that, that other stuff, well, what he, he had to get out from underneath that, that thing. Well, he's discovered where a lot of the trauma in his family, what he witnessed, right, with him yeah. and his brother. Yeah. Because for his brother to go do that, right, which was so sad, we interviewed the Billets, right? And the Billets, poor, like, they love these two, like, like they, they they were their own kids, right? Both him and his brother were billeting in Winnipeg when it happened. And, and well, actually, Terrence was no longer billeting at this family. He was playing in Nepal, but because the Billet family loved the Tutus and they were gods back then like they sold hundreds of thousands of dollars in caribou jerky and stuff like that it was the two two brothers like you know it like they 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 made brandon manitoba like they put it on the map with those two but 
Terrence was gone, but the family's like, sure, he can stay for the summer while you guys are training. And he dropped Jordan off to his girlfriends. And then Terrence got pulled over for drinking and driving. He'd been, they'd been drinking that night when the cops were trying to do Terrence a favor, right? We interviewed the police chief too, that they knew who he was. The whole town knew who they were. And instead of throwing him in the drunk tank and giving him a criminal record and everything, they were going to drop him off at his address. But the problem was, is that the address they had was the billets, but he legally wasn't there anymore. He was just staying for the summer with Jordan. Jordan was the new billet. Now, the way you're supposed to with the DUI, and this is where this kind of the cops, they admitted it, but not because they don't want legal ramifications, is that if you're dropping off an intoxicated person, you're not putting them in, you're supposed to make sure that somebody answers the door, right? And make sure that they're okay so that you don't have what happened to Terrence, right? That they don't get depressed or hurt themselves or hurt somebody else or get back in the car. So the the billets have worn this guilt forever they burst out. we were all crying when we were there because like the poor Ugh. wife she feels that she got cancer and stuff like that because she let down terrence and they should have answered like the door but the cops never knocked and that's where the billets they actually got sued originally because they're like the gun the ammo wasn't put away properly the three shells that were left over in the toolbox you know and as the billet explained, he's like, man, he's like, these kids grew up in none of it. They were shooting seals and stuff from the time they were 10 years old. They'd always go shoot out in the farm. I never think to lock up the three extra shells, right, that that happened that night. And also, I didn't know that he was dropped off because the cops never actually knocked on the door and woke yeah. them up. They said they did, but they never did. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, wow. the case did get thrown out. Thankfully, the billet family was in charge on top of it crushing them. They read a poem, like this will all be in the film. They read a poem that their son wrote and won all these awards and stuff like that about losing his brother that night because the son had grown up with this for like four years while he was going through or three or four years while he was playing there, right? So um, Jesus, just, it, just it, it's a horrendous thing of what you, any billet. I billet a girl now for my daughter's hockey team and I couldn't imagine like I was just thinking about like, oh my God, she's so part of our family now and we call her the billet sister and my my daughter and her will probably go to each other's weddings. Like I couldn't imagine what that, and that poor family, they hadn't talked to Jordan really since his retirement, right? Because he'd just been busy and just not that there's any hard feelings. And they were, they, they wrote us this great message, which lets you know you're on the right story of the doc that they're like, thank you for bringing Jordan back to our family. It was so great to see him and actually talking about all this was very therapeutic for us. And we, because they were hesitant at first, understandably, they're like, look, we don't want to be remembered as the billet family of like that, we don't want that to be the only staple is like we billeted lots of kids that, you know, we lost a son that day. We don't want to be remembered as, and we're like, absolutely not. So Jordan had to call them and he came that day. And Jordan has just been a, a dream to work with. Like you, you talk about like perfect example. You want to know, like, you know, some people, and I'm sure you guys run across them in radio interviews. Some people, pretend to be genuinely nice or they they're good but they're kind of like hey you don't ask me for one more signature you're kind of pissing me off now or one more photo right they kind of get to their limit jordan like obviously we've we've been on the land together and stuff now so there's a relationship there probably closer than anybody we've we've had of any of our films but you know jordan my son was competing in Kelowna at a jiu-jitsu tournament and jordan's like hey i saw on your instagram you're coming to Kelowna." i'm like guys yeah. i want you text me or call me. I'm like, well, it's a couple of days. And I figured you'd be busy. He's got two young daughters that, and he's like, dude, no, I'm definitely like, let's go for coffee. I'm like, well, actually my son's competing. Like, and he's like, what? He's like, your son's competing in a tournament and you didn't tell me. And I was like, well, dude, you're busy. Like, and he's like, where and when? And like an hour later, he was there for the final match of, you know, my son's oh, game. Wow. <laughs> my son won. And, and my son, obviously, because they know who I'm working on and watch, they're like, Dad. my son right away is like, yeah, that's Jordan Tutu. And I was like, yeah, he's like, what's he doing here? I'm like, he came to watch you. And Ryder's like, what? He came to watch me? <laughs> like, he is awesome, so man. excited. And Jordan's like, hey, bud, good match. And I got a photo of the two of them like this. And Ryder's like, Dad, I can't believe well, Way to promote fighting, Scorgy. Way to promote <laughs> fighting. <laughs> um, you know what? You're, you're working on, I, I said this to Dean. Because we talked about um, calling you last week when we had the idea about um, doing a documentary on on podcasting in Canada about uh, this podcast and some changes that that we're going to go through here in the new year. And I said Adam would be, I mean, 
I, I said he's not gonna he's not gonna do the podcast or the documentary for us, but he'd be a great guy to uh, to bend his ear about. But when I w- was on the phone with Dean, I was like, okay, now we've had three or four conversations with Adam in the last year or so. And, and I, from what I know, he's working on this. Like you have how many projects on the go right now? Too many, <laughs> too many. I've like got five or two. Dolph. So we've got, yeah. So we're, we're in, we're in post-production on Dolph. It's getting edited right now. I can hear it. We're, we're going to be going to post on two, two. We're almost completely wrapped post. We're just going through legal of thunder, the life and death of Arturo Gotti, a three part crime series about his death in Brazil. Um, what? Or his, or his murder, yeah, we should say. Uh, uh, yeah, and then we're, uh, what else? We were, and then we just started Biff Naked. Uh, we're, we were just in Paris with her there. And then we finally have Breaking Olympia um, releasing, which is about Phil Heath, the seven time. That Olympia. one's done. That's done. We're just waiting. There's a big studio, can't say who, they've worked with us before, hint, hint, is probably gonna release it. So it'll be, uh, we it's got to work not with- Not CBC. <laughs> Not CBC. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. Not CBC. So you got uh, like you you've got you're perpetually doing stuff like you're perpetually. So when Locke calls you and he's like, "Hey, we want because l- l- let me just tell everybody how this happened." So Adam is like, <laughs> this is so he good. is not just above our pay grade. He's legitimately one of the world's best documentarians and yes. you've all seen his stuff from the union to uh ice guardians to uh, the treo documentary which was phenomenal yeah. uh ice ice guardians is one of my favorite of all time by the way um but but Thank like you. so so he gets this thing in his head he's like we got to do a documentary because we're we're changing the format we're you know uh, all all nice, good story. ties right but long story short we we've been muddling through this for the past three years great stories to tell a whole bunch of different stuff. so he calls me he's like we're doing a documentary and i'm like okay and he's like are you around for a phone call and i'm like sure no problem so he calls me and out of nowhere it's not just him on the facetime there's award-winning <laughs> documentarian adam scorgy on the phone on the facetime <laughs> I am I'm on my couch and I just finished dinner and I'm like, we're literally doing this with Adam Scorgy right this second. Like it's fucking what are you kidding me right now? And so we get you on the phone, Adam. I knew it was like, good. Yeah, I had to call Adam. And that no, this is the best part. So we flesh it out. This is what Scorgy says. He goes, you know, just use your iPhone and keep me posted. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, like, it's, like, it's like calling Scorsese for a pizza bagel commercial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, I, I, actually, I sent you guys the invoice for that that guided that uh, consultation. Yeah, that, that, that FaceTime where you're in the yeah, ring at your kids' bucks. hockey practice. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But I couldn't believe you took like it, it was it was just surreal, right? I'm like, oh, there's Adam Scorgi and Lachlan's like, yeah, we're doing it. So we're just gonna call the Scorsese of documentarians, as Ryan puts out. Let's do this right now. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you guys for even considering me in, in that. Like that, that's a huge compliment. But, yeah, uh, oh, you, you look really like <laughs> chuffed about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I really appre- appreciate that. But it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I've something. I, I think I've talked to you guys about this before. But when I got into this industry, and I'm, I was trying to learn on how to make it a business and not a hobby. It drove me nuts dealing with a lot of people in the industry. I realized early because I came from, you know, inheriting a strip club and like. I didn't like a lot of the people in here and their fucking stuck what? up noses of like, yeah. Yeah, wait, I, stop it. wait. We know the strip up. club yeah. story. All right. All or right. If you just told that on my, you maybe that's a locker room. Thing. You guys didn't know that? You, you inherited oh, a totally strip club? That. You just yeah. inherited one? Is that, yeah. that what happened? I did. Well, as you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys, they, that didn't happen for you guys at 23? No, I inherited my grandpa's old <laughs> war medals in his watch, but yeah. uh, you got a got strip club, dishes. which is great. Uh, how does it's one inherit a rifle? I got a rifle. <laughs> well, here's the thing: is it's not as fucking magical as it sounds. Okay, it, uh, <laughs> it, it, it isn't. Uh, what was the name it, of it? What was the name uh, of it? Cheetahs in Kelowna. Cheetahs. I remember run this story. Wow. Did you run it? Like, did you literally inherit and then go run it? And whose was it? How did you get yeah. it? Yeah, it was my. It was my dad's. So my dad started it in '98. I worked I like there out, out of high school. I, you know, I worked the door, bartended. Uh, did all that stuff. And my dad had, was setting it up for me to take over. But then I left to go to acting school and film school in New York. I was like, I don't, dad, I don't, I don't want to own a strip club. Like I don't, I want to get out of club. I want to do my own thing. I want to, um, so, but then, yeah, my dad died a couple years after I left or like he was sick and I came back and then 
I inherited, I like literally inherited and had to run it and get proper books and stuff because my dad didn't do proper account like books. Like there was like the business always looked like it just made money because it was a cash business, <laughs> right? And like, <laughs> well, and like you know, I so know. to get so to get legit, was there a night where a lot of bikes parked in the back? All, all the time so well, for free so this is so this is where the stress and the, the world of where it we becomes unmagical so for those that don't know how strip clubs work i'll give you a yeah. little insight did you have and, cover charge at the door there's my only question before you tell the course. story okay good so it was a high not for ladies ladies right. were in for free <laughs> yeah, right? so, obviously but so in canada a lot of the stripping agencies that book the girls because the girls are like models and they get booked all over the country and even go down to the states the agencies are owned or used to be owned or fronted are owned by members of motorcycle clubs right so yes. they pay yes. commission so my dad was really close to the most prominent motorcycle club in canada which we all know who they are uh i grew up with all those guys a lot of the guys that are the Kelowna chapter like I saw them go through the ranks when they were hang arounds and then prospects and then sergeant of arms and then pre like the president of the Kelowna chapter is somebody my dad and I have known for a long time. I oh, so you're covered. You, you're never afraid of anything then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. except for when you, yeah, that's it. That's, that's uh, it. it. It had an old sign though. That's a new sign. We didn't have, there used to actually be like two cheetahs that would come in like this. <laughs> I think I remember the old sign. I actually yeah. spent a, a summer in, in, in Kelowna. I think I got oh. kicked out of cheetahs. <laughs> well, that is very possible. We kicked out a lot of people, if you weren't paying. It means you weren't behaving well because we, we allowed a lot of mayhem in there. So That's right. That's right. Yeah. You know what I, I was, what the, the guys, like I've been to a strip joint, I would say a handful of times in my life. And, and I'll tell you why. Mm. It's because I walked the very first time I went to one, I'm like 21, 22 years old. It's in Windsor, Ontario, or maybe 23, Windsor, Ontario. Walk in. And I, I looked at like the place is empty except for the front row. And I don't know what they call it. Like, they had a name for the guys in the front row. I think it's called row, Sniffers. Yeah, Dirt yeah. Row, Sniffers, Sniffers, Sniffers Row. Sniffers Row. And there's a whole and, bunch of those kind of things. Yeah. And and each whole bunch of those kind of things. And each guy had one beer and they were it was like they were in a trance. It was it was like it was like I I they had to be there for the afternoon by themselves individually. And I'm like, and I'm I went and sat down next to him and I'm like how often do you come here? He's like, shh, she's dancing. <laughs> it's her Don't blanket bother song. Cinnamon. Shut up. Shh. So she's how did you stairway. get out? Stairway. <laughs> how did yeah. you get out of that, Adam? Uh, it was it was tough because I had to I had to get proper books and stuff for a while, but then I ended up getting. I had a bad deal with a childhood friend who took over as a partner. He still owns the building and um and everything now, but. I knew like I never wanted to be in there, especially once my wife got pregnant with our daughter. I was like, I'm not going to be a strip club owner and have a daughter. Yeah. Like that's just not happening. Yeah, it's tough. not not how I saw. I never wanted it when it was going to be given to me. I, I didn't want that. It's a shitty world, right? Like nightclubs, yeah. nightclub business and strip club business, a shitty world. It's horrible hours and you're dealing with, you know, you're you're, you're on the edge. The insurance and everything is so risky because now you got idiots that will like you'll serve them properly, but you know, they'll sneak in booze, they'll be doing drugs too, and then they'll go crash their car and then they're suing the bar saying it's your fault I was an yep. idiot, right? So yeah. your insurance and stuff is through the roof and then you're always dealing with, you know, the culture had shifted. When when we grew up, there wasn't a lot of like the weapons yet. Like now you go to almost any nightclub, even in Kelowna, they're, you know, they got metal detectors and pat downs and stuff. We didn't have that when I was growing up that, you know, was dormant. You just kind of kept an eye out and looked. And my dad, Cheetah's, was the last place in Kelowna that allowed the members to wear full colors because we all knew the guys. Kelowna was small. So you wanted to be able to identify them. And usually the nights when all the members were in there was when nothing went wrong, right? Yep. It's yep. usually oh, the shit. young punks that are trying to make yep. a name for themselves that are always trying to be the, they're trying to show how badass they can be. They're trying to make a point in, in the community. So, yep. you know, I, I, I wanted to get out right away. I, I didn't do it very well. I ended up being like, I, 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 I should have got way more money, uh, but I I just wanted out. I didn't want that lifestyle. I didn't want to have, I wanted to yeah. have kids and, and have a proper family. And I knew when you're in there, I don't care if you're the best guy ever. If you're around temptation like that all the time, you're going to make a mistake. You can't yeah. like, that's just, 
That's why you don't go in that business. My dad was clearly single. He wasn't married, right? So he was a perfect strip club owner, right? So yeah. He could do whatever yeah. he wanted, right? Yeah, I think People a lot always, of guys look at, like, like when I grew up, I was like 21, 22. I'm like, it'd be great to own a strip club. You could drink and just look at naked chicks all day. And then you don't realize what happens in those strip clubs if you haven't been to them, right? No, you're, like, you're, this you're, you know, you're, you're dealing, you got girls come in and they're all, you know, sad to see their young girls. They're all fucked up, right? And you have to fire them and send them home when they got no money because they're all fucked. They're high on coke and yep. messed up. And you're like, because it's one of the rules when they sign their contract. Like you can't be high or drunk. And of course, we bend the drunk shift just like servers. But when you're falling off the stage because you're a fucking mess, like we have to fire you and send you home, right? And then there they're balling. And, and you see it why like most girls that dance, right? Like I'm just coming from what I learned in my years of being in there have daddy issues. That's why they want the attention of all the men, right? That's most of them want, they don't have either a lack of a father or a father that was there was very neglectful or no father at all. So yeah. generally why a lot of them get into there. Yeah. Do you have theme nights? Because there, I went to this one place in Barrie, Ontario, where I'm pretty sure it was like C-section night. I'm just yeah, asking. We, <laughs> we didn't have that, but we had our amateur contest was pretty legendary actually. <laughs> yeah, pretty, well, I'll say Dean, because you talk about like, and that shocked me because, like, I mean, my dad started this when I was, like, I was graduating high school when he turned it from a nightclub to a strip club. And it became, it was, the when my dad passed away, it was the hottest spot in town. So, it was huge. You no, know, and, and before, this is before Cologne had Cactus Club or before Joey's had remodeled. Like, so you basically had downtown. You had gotcha splashes and you had the nightclubs, which were on the street over. And then yeah. everybody, the only thing really downtown was Rose's Pub earls and us so you'd come downtown you'd go there and then everybody would come to our place from like 10 till midnight one o'clock and then they go to the nightclubs to go dancing and everything and i don't just mean the guys like when americans would come they're like why are all these girls hanging up here right and it was like because we never we never made money off the girls for doing private shows so the girls would do some of them's really spectacular shows on stage. And then they never touched guys. They never harassed them for private shows. They didn't give a, they made their money by the contracts we paid them. So they didn't care. So girls liked coming, like girls do like to see other beautiful women dance and put on shows. What detours girls from going to most strip clubs is the private shows every two seconds, the hustle, yeah. right? Where the girl's like, let's yeah. go do private show. Let's go do private show. But you know, girls are kind of like, fuck off. It's my boyfriend. I don't want him to go do private show, right? Like just go on stage and want to watch you up there. Yeah, and perform. So ours, Cheetos was really just like a nightclub with naked girls. And I remember when Americans would come, they'd always be like, why is there so many girls in here? And we're like, well, it's just nothing's busy until like one o'clock. So everybody, it was the spot, right? That came mm -hmm. down there. And the, we had a section that was elevated and stuff. And that's where the members used to always sit. And it, everybody used to say, they're like, oh, I you thought you members? Could sit there. I thought that was only for the members. It was like, well, no. It, anybody can sit there, but you can just, when they sat there, nobody else tried to sit in that area. Right. So it was always kind of, we used to I drink at either. the pier on the, on the other side of the floating yeah, bridge. Yeah. Pier Marina, yeah. Before that, yeah, before and, that uh, had financial combustion and burnt down. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> Malona had lots of bars that just burnt down all the time. That was kind of like, yeah. they couldn't pay their bills. Fire the scary, yeah. I heard. Yeah, yeah. Financial combustion. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. A friend of mine um, uh, that I uh, used to drink and party with at the at the Lake Okanagan Resort, um, he was quite heavy into a drug that I avoided. And uh, he, we were at the pier one day, and he comes back to the table and he's all pissed off. He goes, "Oh, those fuckers put Pam on the back of the toilets." <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, Kelowna, Well, you know, his nickname when I was going there, I think it's changed now with the fentanyl scare, but the Okanagan. Like, I mean. That was the <laughs> well, that's what you say. That's what it was. Like, I, yeah. I remember part of the reason why I wanted to move away is I couldn't find a girl that was, you know wasn't on coke attractive that wasn't like into blow four or five yeah. times a week. And like, yeah, can yeah. anyone not want to chew their face off? Like, I man, I I always got sketched out because I never did it, right? So when I'd go to the after parties, because again, when you work the nightclubs, you don't sleep normal hours. So people are like Adam come to the after party and stuff like that. And I'd be like, cool. So I'd I'd come and I'd be like, okay, like, you know, physically I'd be like, wow, this girl's really sexy. And then like chewing her face off. And I'm like, yeah. oh fuck. like, and then I was in those parties, like, because I boxed competitively and where I always thought I was gonna get in a fight or stab. Like everybody seemed so angst up and like so like, ramped up. Oh, like, see a man, like, yeah. And I'd be like, dude, like fuck, <laughs> fucking breathe. chill out. Yeah, cool. decaf, I, man. I, it's like, no, no, this is the Coke and Ogden. I'm fucked. Yeah, well, no, that was the thing is everybody <laughs> tried to you this. like mine? <laughs> Grinding their teeth and the whole, yeah. I never, yeah. And I ask because some of my friends still dabble in that now. And I'm like, man, with the fentanyl scares, are you not fucking like, 
And they're like, oh, we pay like four times the price to get it from. Because I used to know a lot of street dealers. Like, oh, that's it. That just listen. We pay four times the price for our totally illegal coke that was smuggled into Canada in someone's <laughs> anus. So we know it's good. That's right. We know it's fine. We know. I have friends good. like that too. They've been doing coke for twenty years. The old Richard Pryor joke. Whereas these guys are like, I'm like, dude, you got to stop doing coke. It's just not good for. I don't even drink. But when you you talk to guys that do coke, my my, my buddy, and I won't say his name, Colin. He's like, dude, I do coke <laughs> recreationally, and I've done it for twenty years, and I'm fine. I'm like. Think about what you just said, shithead. <laughs> like, yeah. literally think about it. You've been on coke for 20 years and you do it Although, and he, you know this, See, you know I'm fine. <laughs> and I, I double check. I don't know. I haven't done the research on this because I haven't been doing like the drug docs in a while. But I heard that people now that have been doing it, there's so much fentanyl in it that if you like the, you've done lines, if you're an, like even a, a casual cocaine user, you are now built up a tolerance to fentanyl because it's a hundred percent. Like there's no way you can get it now that there isn't my new traces because they're yeah, smuggling I've the same that. things they're cut from the same things that mm -hmm. you've just got a tolerance for it now. Right. That, is it true that if you don't snort it, wow. like if you put it in your asshole that the fentanyl won't hurt you, is that true? Yes or no? Have you heard I that? Have no idea. <laughs> I I've never heard that. that. I never heard that. I, I don't know. That's tell you that? jokes. I don't know. Yeah. I don't snort it. I hoop it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I don't, I don't, that's, but I, Guys, do know, I, I, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a Coke problem. I don't even sniff it as a matter of fact. In fact, I'm so anal about doing recreational Coke. I only put it in. In my asshole. Yeah. Well, at least you're committed, Dean. You, you keep it. <laughs> we make uh, it an evening. You're committed. You're good. But but I know I was talking actually to a friend of mine that's a paramedic in the Okanagan, and he said, "Man, he's like, you have no idea uh, how many times I've come to pretty prominent oh, figures yeah. in the community where I've had to Narcan the whole room because they did a bad batch and they thought they were just going to have a casual party and fucking people started turning blue, like so." I don't know. Like, that's one I've told to my daughter now when we have talks. Like, I have a really good talk with my daughter. She's a, you know, competitive hockey player. And I was like, look, Riley, you're going to try things. That's what teenagers do. You try, like, <clears throat> I tried smoking weed. I tried doing mushrooms. I didn't really dabble in anything else. I never did anything chemical. I just didn't like, I saw it too much in the nightclubs and I didn't like how people were on it. So yeah. I never, fortunately, I never did XC, never did Coke, even though it was everywhere around me. But I said to my daughter, I'm like, Riley, you have to be scared. And this isn't a parent trying to give you an urban legend, like all drugs are bad and they'll kill you. But nowadays there is, you could take one pill that you get from some shithead and you'll die. And there's nothing, even if we catch and get it to the, like, they don't get, if you don't get Narcan quick enough, you know, all the hospital is going to say is say your goodbyes because it's, you know, there's nothing you can do. Right. Yeah. We didn't have that scare lock when you were growing up. And it was like, you know, that, that was not a scare. You were, you I were got scared like, in yeah. Kelowna. Yeah. It's part of the reason why I think I, I stayed away from it because I, I was, I dabbled a little bit when I was there. And, um, and one night we were, um, we were in a, in a, we were playing poker and somebody came running into the, into the living room where we were playing cards and said, so-and-so is in the back and he was smoking something and, and he's jerking like a chicken now. And he, uh, he OD'd and, um, a buddy of mine and I were the, the two guys that went, well, fuck, we got to take him to the hospital. And so we literally threw him in the back of a car and rushed him to emergency in Kelowna. And it's like, it's, they see it like hourly. So it was no so surprise. Bad. That that was something, yeah, like the, the deaths in Kelowna during COVID for opium overdoses versus COVID deaths. Like it was not even fucking close. Opium no. debt, like per capita, Kelowna is one of the worst because it's a party now, right? So it is, yeah. I, I know so there's about are. 20 guys from the bar in, in Kelowna that I keep seeing on Facebook so-and-so passed away this guy passed away this guy all around my age or younger because they it was the one time they they took a bad batch or oh, whatever no, I, and of course you know you know what it's about but i'm obviously you're not emailing people like how exactly did he die right or so and so it's the first yeah, thing he, i do that's the first yeah. dude you don't do that but that's the first yeah. thing i do when someone tells me they got divorced or a friend of mine died i'm yeah. like whose fault was it how did they die that's like the first thing I ask somebody and it just never stopped. And to the point, to your point, I've had, we've lost two people, friends of mine uh, in the last, I would say six months now, six yeah. months. Uh, everybody knows somebody that, that has died from alcohol. Alcohol is another one, right? I, in the last couple of years, yeah. everybody's just fucking. Gah, 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 gah. Yeah. Um, it's a problem, man. Like it, and it, and attacks, not a lot of people understand heart attacks, liver due issues. To yeah. Overindulgence in recreational <laughs> drugs and alcohol. Yeah, yeah. Right? he died of a heart attack. Well, well I partied with Rick, and I yeah. know what he died from.
And yeah, it was all the cocaine. Did ever, in the, but did uh, you ever alcohol. see? Like, have you seen like recent numbers on like liver transplant surgeries just in Canada alone, and people that are no. walking in from the street? It's gone up like two hundred percent over the past two years. People that yeah. have drinking or substance related organ failure. Like, I'm, I'm not. I'm. I'm not surprised. I mean, they're seeing now like part of this backup you're seeing all in Canada for all healthcare services is that's what you go when you shut everything down for two years, right? To focus on one issue and now all these other ones are bubbling up right but they've they were talking about the opioid epidemic i'm in the doc business so you've seen a lot of this come up before and having a brother that's in recovery and worked with danny and now tutu like you know alcoholism is a is a major problem but it's it's sexy right you see it at the super bowl it's in the movies james bond chicken or stirred it's it but alcohol is like you know one of the worst drugs that you can fuck with like it is alcohol is actually in fact the only drug that if you are so physically addictive you can't quit cold turkey you can from heroin you can Not from cold, crystal meth you, with with booze you can die that's how actually amy winehouse died was yep. not yep. leaning off and she went cold turkey and died right it is so hard on your body my cousin just had that where he was so fucked up when he went into detox he, he had no balance for 10 to 12 days like he couldn't he was so fucked because he'd been drinking so much that he couldn't ets yeah he couldn't yeah. like i and i was like what and they're like yeah he couldn't even stand or hold a glass for almost a week because to gold cold turkey and they he was in detox so they're giving him just enough like through uh stuff so that he didn't die and have seizures and just shut his body down right like mm. it is crazy how hard alcohol is on the body too yeah. I, I, I friend bet of mine, you uh, if they brought it up today, like if alcohol didn't exist until today, knowing what we know about the FDA, knowing how we treat uh, smoking, knowing how we treat all that other shit, uh, tobacco, knowing how we treat drugs. I bet you if they decide and listen, it mm -hmm. is the season. I'm not I never shit on anybody's drinking. You guys know that. Like I never. work with two guys that love the love the boost. think it's great. Mm -hmm. No problem at all. But I, I want to beer this. right now. Go for it. You should do it. You're hungover. It's it'll get, it'll help with the hangover, though. It does. Yeah, help right. You might have a seizure if you don't have one, so you better have one. Um, but do you, just a quick question. Do you think that if alcohol didn't exist up until 2023, they would even fucking approve it for human consumption? Oh, probably, probably, probably not. But, you know, having done a prohibition doc, I learned like you usually do far more harms from making it prohibited because that those are stats we actually found like alcohol deaths and everything during prohibition were like the highest like per yeah. capita even now even with all the promotion everything they were because worse they then. find it somewhere else like in like oh, and then you're getting and shit, and shit yeah. mix right where it can yeah. like make you go yeah. blind and shit because it's so pure and like like that's yeah. actually how like you know that's how like i uh, this is in our history that that's how like how mix was created right is because to smuggle it you're going to smuggle the more potent bottles right so originally like Whiskeys and stuff were just meant to be sipped, right? But mix came because you get all these shitty, in the speakeasies, they would just get a shitty vodka or whatever made in some fucking home distillery. They're like, this is gross. They're like, you have to put mix in it just to be able to tolerate it. But it was like smuggling drugs. It was like, you want the pure cocaine so you can buff it and sell it in four layers. You wanted the pure proof so that you could dilute it and then sell it in the speakeasies and make more money. So now at least, you know, you go into a regulated establishment, it has all the stuff on it, it's gone through some checks and balances. And, and then it is up to like the culture of like making sure that you educate your kids. And it's really interesting is like, one of the big things I do is like, sure, I'll have a beer and stuff in front of my kids, but my kids will never see me intoxicated. That's an important thing because I never saw my dad and all my years of my dad owned a nightclub. My dad was my dad had congenital, he's born with congenital heart problems. So he never drank. You never saw my dad as one of those drunk owners that was being a sleaze and stuff like that. In fact, I, what's so bizarre and touching about my dad is that I've had probably 50 people in my life that have reached out just saying, Hey, I have to tell you how important your dad was to me. And you're kind of thinking like, what? Your dad was a strip club owner, but my dad had moral issues about being a strip club owner is that obviously the hours and he liked the, you know, talking to people and, 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 and being kind of the guy that shook your hand at the door and being an owner that you could approach. But my dad didn't like seeing people go too far. And I remember he'd pull all kinds of people aside and be like, you're getting too fucked up. You need to get your life in order. And they're like, wow. it's a bar where you're meant to get fucked up. And he's like, no, not like this. You come and have fun. And like one of them, a good friend of ours now, she owns a really prominent accounting firm in Calgary because he pulled her aside and said, no, this isn't for you. I don't like seeing you get this fucked up. And she's like, whatever, I'm just part. And he's like, no, not you. I'm pulling you from this. You're going to start. I'm not going to have you as a waitress working for me anymore. You're going to be in my accounting 
thing and you're going to start organizing my books and my paperwork. Holy and shit. then he kept putting her through school and everything else. And now she owns a very prominent accounting firm in Vancouver or in Calgary. So she she might be the store. only stripper who put herself she wasn't through. A stripper. She wasn't a stripper. Okay. okay. She's just a waitress. Few. <laughs> very few that they're just dancing to save money to go to school. Yeah. Law was, school yeah, or law accounting school. school. Yeah. 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 Law school yeah. or accounting school. Everybody. That was, that was a common thing that I'd heard too, as the owner. And I'd be like, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just a couple of years when you go through school. Yep. Got it. Got it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Adam, I'm only here for my two week contract. Cause as soon as this is done, I'm going straight to law school. Right. Yeah, two yeah, years later. Again, well, you're back. How was law school? Uh, that's next year. I'm just yeah, trying to make some very few. No, no. I'm talking about, like patrons and stuff that came through and obviously there was some dancers that were still friends with and my 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 wife is too that uh because she helped me run it for the year that's actually what brought us together she was good friends with my dad and knew me clone a small town right so we grew yeah, up yeah. together it was actually my father's passing that kind of brought us together so um but yeah that's awesome. That's awesome. Adam Scorgi is our guest. Locke, you want to say something? Then well, because I I feel like we got to let Adam go here soon. But yeah. I want to just um I want to just throw this at you because we are kind of I, I think we're going to do this. We're going to do a doc, and just based on um a, a quick synopsis that that we gave you the other night. Do you think there's that there's a story there about? um about what this is right now and and where it's going and the struggles that that we've had and the and the consolidation of the business the, the the mainstream business and people gravitating towards this do you think there's something there no i definitely as i told you guys there i i seriously think there is something there but like i said when we we're on the phone the tr troubles is you're not going to sell this traditionally to have a budget to make it beforehand right so you're going to have to do a lot of grassroots stuff in order to tell the story yeah right that's how you're going to have to put it together and and capturing exactly who are the key characters to help tell the narrative that you're going through is the key part. And that's what I told you to be malleable there because it grows. Like every doc we did, you know, we have a basic idea of who we think on the surface and doing your wiki search and everything else who you think is going to be able to tell your story. Mm -hmm. But then even as you interview people, as you start getting into, you know, interviewing other podcasters and people that are in this space that are like, oh, you should really, this guy's the godfather of Canadian podcasts. Like, you know, then you sit down with them and you're like, holy cow, I just learned so much new stuff. It might mold into something different. So don't, yeah. that's what I meant. But I, I definitely, there's always everybody, I, I tell this and I mean this, like everybody's got a story to tell, right? Because hmm. ultimately, even when you connect with Dolph or Tutu, it's the human aspects that gets everybody to relate. The fact that they did it in like, you know, more prominent circumstances where people see them like Dolph in TV or Tutu as a professional hockey player, or Biff as a musician those are great right so that's why we're able to pre-sell them because there's a built-in audience that we know we can tap into but everybody's got a great story and you can have like a great example as i see this kind of being without maybe the crazy characters i don't know if you guys have ever seen king of kong and a fistful of quarters but one of the greatest documentaries ever about two like legendary donkey kong players the game. oh yeah yeah i have seen that yeah right when you're yeah. watching like i remember as a filmmaker i'm like how like what what this is isn't this? scripted this isn't a mockumentary like these guys <laughs> actually fucking exist and they yeah. they do and it's one of those ones and i'm not saying you have characters like that but that's a story and that that crushed like that went out and like it, it everybody fucking loved it and at time they were looking at doing a real movie with johnny depp and everything playing the main the oh, wow. bad guy and there are a lot of great docs that can find life and do festivals and tell a great story um they're just hard to get traditional financing for Okay. So you're Perfect. saying we're going to have to get it from the Hells Angels and you're our conduit. To I, that, I, right? I, yeah. I wouldn't recommend borrowing money from them. Their interest rates are even higher than Bank of Canada than the new ones that we're going with now. Oh, I don't know. Have <laughs> you seen those right lately? <laughs> yeah, they're they're even higher. <laughs> so if you think the banks are bad, they're, they're even higher. Uh, <laughs> I think, and they get their money back much more effectively than, oh, yeah. Yeah. than a nasty letter saying, we're coming to get you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you don't get a phone call papers. from a collection agency. You get two broken legs. Yeah, so some guy you haven't called me back and you've got interest door. rates piling yeah. up, right? You get a <laughs> yeah. Friday Bank. or uh, it gets worse. <laughs> Friday or you're missing fingers, kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll you're start pink. with your pinky because that's a useless finger. We'll work our way to the thumb and then... Yeah, I, I've always thought that. Listen, if someone was going to come for me and say, give me the money, uh, I'd say you start with the pinky toe because I don't need that. I don't even use it. You can, If you need the pinky finger, you can take that too. doesn't matter. Like I like how you think you get a choice in that negotiation, but that's yeah. cool. Dude. That's cool. That's yeah. Oh, you don't? <laughs> you can't pick a limb? It's kind of like Chinese COVID testing. 
Yeah. yeah. Sometimes <laughs> they go in the bomb. Yeah. And you, well, I've got an you don't get a cho- you don't get a choice. Yeah. So I'll leave you. I've I've got an interesting story with that. So I don't know if you guys can see it, but I got a I got a scar here where I was hit with a, a bottle. So I was I was coming back from I was living in New York at the time and I was working, starting to go to film school and starting my career out there. And I came home to Kelowna and we're all out partying. And we go to we left my dad's club, Cheetahs. He was still alive and running it. And we went over to it was called Splashes. I think it's called, I don't know what's called now, Level or something else now in Kelowna. But and I was with a buddy of mine, and some girls were interested in him. And the girls he's with were with some uh they are members now, a few of them at the times they were not members of the club. They were but they were wearing support prospect stuff. They were affiliated in some level. I'd all seen them in the bar at my dad's bar earlier, but uh they came up and they told my buddy, because also my buddy was black, and in Cologne at the time there wasn't a lot of black fellas, so they were kind of like, Hey fucking beat it fro boy uh get the fuck out of here so i was like uh i went over to diffuse the problem but i used to box competitively and i used to i used to get into quite a few fisticuffs back in the day so my buddy as soon as i got there it got kind of tough and then he's like what's that all you motherfuckers want to suck my dick right and like you should say like <laughs> they, oh yeah so he's not a good, good friend <laughs> not good so all of a sudden, honestly, it was the weirdest. Like they all stopped for a second. Dude, be like, what are you doing? Well, no, they, they were like, up. no, because my buddy was not. A, he's a slight guy, and they were all like, always like, that guy. Yeah. They were like, this motherfucker just say that? Like you could have dropped the pin. Like it felt like the the music in the nightclub fucking went dead. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, I was like, hey, 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 and I wanted to tell him who my dad was because my dad, you know, obviously with the club. He booked the girls. We knew a lot of the members. Like we were very, we we're friends with a lot of them, right? So we I was yeah. going to diffuse the things. Met who my dad was. So they're like, "Hey!" At this point, they're calling the N word, saying, "Get back here!" And I went to put my arm in front to be like, "Hey, like this, my dad is a misunderstanding. Sorry, I'll get him to apologize." And then he swatted my arm, and then I put it again. And whack! I got hit with a beer bottle right over my head. And then I didn't want to like I, I again. I'd been through. I'd been in my fair share of fights, so I did. I didn't even. It didn't even phase me. I just thought I got hit at the time. I didn't know it was a bottle and I, but I knew I didn't want to get hit again. So instantly, once I got hit, I just, boom, I, I knocked out the guy that hit me and then a fucking brawl ensued. Right. Because I hit a prospect or a friend or a support member. Yeah. But I knew all the doormen too. So the doorman came. You punched and, a hell's angel. Well, we'll get to it. So it wasn't a hell's angel. <laughs> yeah. so oh, okay. That's better. It's, it's more interesting. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so I knock out the one guy and now a brawl yeah. ensues and I'm tussling with an another guy but then the doorman kind of split up and grab other guys and at this point like I got blood dripping in my eyes and my other friend who was a killer had choked one of them out and then we kind of just walk out on our own accord other than I got this huge gash I'm, I'm bleeding everywhere and um we walk out and I guess the doorman had another 10 20 minute fight because the door like the the a lot of the prospect guys were like how the how dare you fucking touch us and like they're like well there's a fight like we're doorman that's what we're supposed to do so i get i get back to the club uh, to my dad's club because it was just across the street and my dad's once he sees me he's flipping the fuck out he's like who the fuck did this he's like they're fucking dead my son's going to new york to work in the film industry fucking kill this guy blah 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 and then his phone rings and we're talking like there was no smartphones he had one of the star i don't know if you guys remember those flip flop analog ones back in the day though because they were little yeah he gets a call and it is a full member of the the that uh, of the hell's angels that calls and he goes, Oh, apparently our children got into a fight tonight. <laughs> and my dad's like, Oh fuck. Cause he knows the guy, they're friends. And he goes, Oh shit. It was your son. And he's like, yes. He's like, we're going to have to, we're going to need to have a little sit down tomorrow and kind of discuss how this all went down and what happened. And my dad's like, Adam, you punched out a hell's angel son. And I was like, well, I got hit with a bottle. I didn't really have much time to fucking go through it. Right. Like, I didn't, ask I didn't, for didn't have time to check my Rolodex. Yeah. yeah I, didn't, I didn't have time. And he was like, okay, shit. So we actually went to where you talked about Locke. We went to the Pier Marina pub, yeah, which at the time was owned by the president, who was a good friend of my dad's. And he said, okay, we'll have the mediation there. And you want to talk about how these sit downs go. It's an interesting world where it you is. go. So, so I'm all stitched up and I got scratches all here. And then the guys we got into a fight, they're at the table next to us, like just about 10 feet away. And we're this looking a at each movie other. Scene. This is a movie scene. I wanted to do, what's his name, that writes Yellowstone and Mayor of Kingstown and stuff to do a series on this. It would crush, but uh, he's that guy's a heavily booked guy right now. Um, anyway, 
So we're, we're sitting at the That's table. That's a great show, dude. Father, son, strip joint owning duo clashing with the fucking Hells Angels. I'd the young that. underwear model it. son punches yeah. one yeah. of the other sons out. <laughs> then you go meet at a pub just to hash it out. And then you got the Hells Angels full patch and awesome. their kids at one table. Oh, well, Jimmy, wait, wait, you get the rest of the story here, Dean. It gets, it, gets, yeah. it gets better. So we're sitting down, right? We're, we're assessing the damages of each other because we wanted to see, you know, you don't always remember everything when you you know, everything happens again. I got hit with a bottle. It's a lot of blood in my eyes. I didn't remember. I just knew the big fight ensued afterwards. And we're, so we're sitting there and, but we're not eyeballing each other. Like we're tough guys. Now we're all in trouble. So they figure out what's happening. So we're looking at each other kind of seeing like, Oh fuck, he's got a big black guy. His nose all messed up. And they were really, so then my dad's friend was the mediator would come back and forth and be like, okay, Adam, what happened? And I was like, well, you know, my buddy was talking to some girls, didn't realize they were with them. They took offense to it. I tried to intervene. And before I knew it, I was hit with a bottle. And at that point I was defending myself. And then they'd go over to the other table and he'd come back. He's like, well, Adam, they're saying that you like disrespected the patch and that you were egging it on and your guys were professionals because one guy got knocked out and another guy was choked out. And I was like, I was like, listen, I was like, like again, this guy knew me, grew up with me and my dad, know me since I was doing coat check in my dad's bar at 15. I'm like, do you really think I would be disrespecting the patch? I'm like, my dad's club, my family's club is the last place you guys are allowed to rock full colors. My dad works with you guys all the time. He goes for Christmas dinners at the clubhouse. Clearly, it was not me disrespecting. And they're like, that's what I said. And then they're like, oh, yeah, well, he was drunk and fucked up. And then I was like, you guys know me. I'm not a drinker. And and, and my dad's friend was like, yep, I mentioned that. Being like, mm, you sure he was drunk? Like, oh, yeah, he was drunk and agitator. And I was like, I, you guys know I never drink, right? Because I am always, I was always worried about fighting back then. So I didn't – I'd have a beer or two, but always stay really sober just in case – because shit used just to go crazy. in case you had to throw some fucking hands, Scorch. Yeah. yeah, just in case, the old days. So they can't do that anymore. But, it, you know, so – they end up going back and forth and then they come and they go, Oh, you know what? We can't get a true story Adam. They keep saying that you sucker punch them and distress and that they never hit you with a bottle. And I was like, look at my face. Does this look like a punch? I'm like, come on, you've been in fights. When do you get scratches and get stitches? Like that's a bottle, right? Hit my head, clearly cut my face. And they were like, they're like, yeah, they're like, well, Oh, we're just going to go to the video. And I was like, perfect. But then I remember he looked at me stone cold and he said, so is there anything in your story you want to correct now because if I go to video and you're lying and you're lying to us, that's a bigger problem, right? But if you're true and you know, like you think, so I remember I just simplified the story. I'm like, my friend was talking to the girls. He didn't like that they did it. I tried to defuse the problem. I got hit with a bottle. I defended myself. And from there it was a brawl. I don't remember all the details and they go, okay. So they go to the tape and then they, sure enough, we were bang on, but they did say they're like, Adam, if you're, if you're in the wrong and you're lying, you're going to get taxed and your dad's going to have to pay like a fine, right? No you, way. You knocked out a Hell's Angel's son. Yeah. And you're going to have to. And if you're lying to us, there'd be further repercussions. So I know you're leaving for New York in a couple of days, but you have to fly home. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's fine. Go to the tape. But sure enough, my story was bang on. They're like, oh yeah, we can see the bottle explode on your head and fucking <laughs> we can see at that point you're defending. I remember the one other thing they asked me is they go, so Adam, who is your other friend that choked the guy out? They want to know who that is. And I'm like, really? I'm like, you guys are asking me to rat out who my friend is that defended me after I got hit with a bottle. I'm like, I'm pretty sure you guys are not big on rats. So I'm not saying who my friend was. I was like, he only jumped in because I got hit with a bottle and then, and a third guy tried to come in. And they're like, yeah. fair enough, fair enough. So my story checked out and they got in big trouble for lying. And it was, uh, it all worked out. And then it just got more respect for me because they're like, you told the truth right from the beginning. And thankfully I didn't get hit in the eye or anything. It was just a, a funny war wound scar to talk about now. Right. But, uh, it uh, could have been worse and Jesus you know, Christ. everybody kind of got out their own way. And, but that's, that's the world. Like I, I like, that's what you I, came from. That's why you're that's not scared of shit. Right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. When I deal with, when I deal with like snooty filmmakers and stuff now, they're like, how dare you talk? I feel like saying like, dude, I'll fucking strangle you and tuck you under my boot. You fucking pussy. Like, you know what I'm saying, right? And in a world where nobody talks like that. Right. And I'd be looked at as an absolute savage. Right. So, oh, shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the truth comes out, huh? That's right. But Last time you were on the show, you, you told us about road rage that you had where you popped yeah. some guy. Yeah. You wanted to pop some guy. You remember that? You had yeah, this kind of road mean. rage incident. And now that you've given us your Hells Angels history and backstory of how you dummied a bunch of them at a club while well, the kids anyway, I'm yeah. like, I'm like, I, I would never like if, if I pulled up to you next to you in traffic and I cut you off and you rolled your window down, you're like, 
I'm going to fucking beat the shit out of you. I just roll my window up and say, I'm really <laughs> sorry, man. I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, I, I try not to be that guy. I've gotten my, it's funny in all my years of fisticuffs that that's what I got the charge for was for throwing a fucking Red Bull can at a guy's car. Out of all well, that, like, and you were on the podcast after you had an anger right management class or something. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, really? <laughs> yeah. Did you have so to go to anger management for real? Yeah, I had, I had to take alternative measures, which you know, <laughs> this kind of goes back earlier, Locke, to get on a more serious note with you know how tough it is when you're coming through generational pain or trauma, right? Like you're the yeah. one indigenous member I talked about is that. When I was going through the legal system, now I'm a producer. My job is to solve problems, right? I can't just yeah. be like, well, we're fucked. We hit this thing. We can't do it, right? It yeah. was so hard to navigate how to do that because when you go down to that courthouse and you have a charge thing, they look at you like you are fucking scum of the earth. Like even I'd come yeah. in a suit all clean. I'd be like, hey, look, I'm trying to find information about my like, yeah. You don't know? And I'm like, no, I don't. It's my first time here. Like, can you help me? And they're like, Pfft. Yeah, your first time here. And I'm like, well, it is like any anger and management. It, wasn't until... it was your first time going. There. D d d d d that's what they said when you showed up. They're like, yeah, like this is your first time. Yeah, that's like, yeah, this is your yeah, first time. I'm hold him like an asshole. You know, I felt like saying, like, yeah. yeah, it fucking is, bitch. Like, like, <laughs> like, 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 like you want to fucking step outside? I'll show you it's my first time. <laughs> yeah. No, I was so, the, you know what? I, I had, so I delayed my case by like three different occasions. And then finally, there was a guy there, there was a volunteer that was like, hey, I've seen you down here a few times. Is there anything can help you with? I'm like, man, I'm just trying to find out where I go to because it's my first charge. Like, and he's like, oh man, you can skip all this. You need to apply for alternative measures. Go over here, fill out this form, and you can skip all that stuff and skip a trial date and go. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, man. And again, like I'm a good problem solver. Like I'm not just someone that goes like, okay, I ran into a brick wall, quit. And it was really hard for me to figure this out and navigate, right? And thankfully, I had a friend of mine who was going through law school, so he'd give me pointers and stuff too. But if yeah. you're coming from, you know, a troubled situation, you don't have money and you don't have a lawyer and you're trying to navigate, yeah. even if you've barely done something wrong or something, it is fucking hard and you can get oh, slapped. Yeah. With it. Like, I look, I was for this and it sounds, I know we can all joke now, thankfully, but I was facing six months in prison and a criminal record, not being able to travel to the States. All because really I hurt some guy's ego. I threw a fucking Red Bull can at his car, right? Did no damage, hit his window. I tossed it like, well, I accidentally lost control of it and in his car, right? <laughs> As it's the courts like, see. Like, but, and the, but, the, the, oh, the funny thing, fell. the funny thing is, is back to the Hell's Angels story. Um, if you would have lied to them like they had said, and and they would have had to do other things, that's what they call it as well. They call it an alternative measures program as well. <laughs> yeah, they would have yeah, to yeah, take alternative measures with well, you. And that, that would yeah. have been ultimate disrespect for my father. My dad had really good, like I'd go visit my mom for Christmas and my dad would go to the local clubhouse and have Christmas dinner and stuff with them. Like they were very close. Like I would never lie in that. I, and I knew I was in the right. I knew enough about having a sit down and stuff is like, I, I, I wasn't involved. I wasn't stepping on anybody's territory. My friend got an altercation. I tried to defuse it. And then I got hit with a bottle before anything could happen. So I was in the right. I knew I was in the right. So it's I knew like I the wasn't. judicial system could have taken a, a few lessons from the hell's angels and how they handled that because it swift quick taking well, care hey, of i i will well say this i joke <laughs> i joke all the time if you've been wronged or something's happened to your kids or loved one and you're trying to like like you know someone's giving you right and you get a, a restraining order and all that bullshit right and they can go just out front of it like there's guys like if anyone ever fucked with my daughter and i couldn't and i couldn't like the Deal law wasn't legally they're supposed to do yeah. Yeah. i'd get it handled way faster like even oh, yeah. the cops will tell you, they'll say, you want to get it handled? Don't go through the court system way faster to get something like good cops that I'm friends with. Because you, if you got someone that has money and knows the law, they can fuck you on this so bad. And they can, there's a horrendous story I read as a father, Locke, and you have a daughter. And, uh, but there was a guy that his daughter had been lured through social media uh, to an older guy, but he wasn't the typical like creep that you'd think. He wasn't like a fat, bald, old he was a handsome, like in his mid twenties, she was 14, 15 or third, like late twenties, early. And the dad like tried everything he could once he caught him. The daughter's like, no, I'm in love with him. He's amazing. And you don't understand. And you're just trying to prevent yeah. us. So he went through all the courts, got restraining orders and stuff like that. He ended up because as a, as a rifle dad, he's like, you stay the fuck away from my daughter. Or I'll fucking beat your head in. Right. So then the guy put restraining orders on him saying, you threaten me, right? You're a threat. And this motherfucker would go to this father's work where he worked to go buy a product all the time. 
and wink and stare because he was allowed, right? The restraining order was put on him the other way around. So he would deliberately go to get in his face and to try to get the dad Jesus to do something. Christ. So he continually charge him. The dad wrote this great piece. And I remember being like, I was mortified, but I was also like, not in this fucking lifetime. That guy would come by my office one time and I'd have him tied up in the fucking forest the next week. And I'd be like, oh, you know, <laughs> is that the guy? Is that the guy in Edmonton that's in jail now? Could be. Could be. I read an article. I don't know, but it was, it was, it was as a, like, you know, because at that age, my daughter, I think when I read it, my daughter was like nine or 10. And I, I remember just being like, oh. I, I, I just was like, I could feel, you know, when you're reading something, it's emotionally, I was just yeah. like, I came to his I have door, it right now. Oh, like, about and, and was like, you know, smiling and be super polite. And again, he's like, he's not the creep that you'd think of a movie. He was very charming and good looking. So he'd win people around him, right? And, sociopath. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I was, I was, I was Psycho. going crazy. I was like, this guy, I was like, I was like, okay. I was like, you know what? If I, I, I it would be very tough for me not to kill him while I was at work. But thankfully the way I've been raised where it's like, Adam, no witnesses. No, like, I'd be, I'm like, no problem, bud. Here's your items that you wanted. Have a great day. Right. And like uh, get his license plate and find out where he is. And we'd get you another time, but I would not get you there. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah. I, I think there are a lot of people out there that will listen to that and go, that's not the way you do it. Listen, there is an underground economy of uh, legal wrangling that you can get yourself into in this country. Oh, and yeah. if you know the right people, you you can have stuff dealt with. And it's not about bikers. It's not about any of that stuff. But sometimes you got to take the law into your own hands a little bit, right? And it's just the way life you know works. What? The system, like I've been through, unfortunately, I've been through litigation and all that stuff. And we don't have enough time. Like I'm getting sued by the UFC right now. Like I, I've been through litigation a lot for a young for uh, I'm not young anymore, 42, I guess. But, you know, I hope you never have to go through litigation. It's a horrible process. And the court yeah. sucks. And you really it realize is. you really realize how broken it is where you're like, oh, these these motherfuckers ripped me off. They're like, no, but can you prove that they ripped you off? And do you have all the evidence? And then you like, uh, and then you go through, and then they send this whole bullshit. They'll give a list of demands on you of like 75 pages. You're like, what? This is all horseshit. None of this even happened. But the way the yeah. courts work, that's now discovery. They put that in there. You then have to spend all the legal time and money to defend all those bullshit arguments and prove yeah. that they're bullshit. And it distracts the whole case and pushes it back. Then you have to go and you're like, like, I remember going through this. I'm like, man, just get me in front of a judge. Also three fucking pieces of evidence. And this is over. They're like, but it doesn't go that way. Right. The lawyers like to milk both sides. Right. And yep. they like to fucking yeah. like how oh, much yeah, does yeah. your client have? How much does your client have? We'll keep pushing this through. Like it, it, I'm it, a it, huge it, fan of lawyers. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> so I got a good one. Thankfully, what I've had now is I have one of my family friends, right, who owns his own yeah. practice, and he became a lawyer. He's like, Adam, I became a lawyer so that my family and other families can't get fucked with. So he's my guy that just anybody comes and says, oh, I, you in your film did this and this. I just send it to him right away. Yeah. And then he usually gets he's. I've had a lot of people try to bark. It gets discouraged right away because I'm like, you're not eating up costs with me. He does it all for me to protect me as family. So it's like, yeah. go ahead. You want to come after mm -hmm. me for some bullshit claim? He'll start emailing your lawyer four times a week so that it's a hundred dollars each email. Every that you time it doesn't cost me a fucking dime. Yeah, yeah dude, it's yeah. the best. It's like we every have. time your lawyer calls and plays, but you can see how wealthy people can abuse that system badly. All the time. It's a strategy for a lot of wealthy people. It's to abuse yeah. like the the ability that a lawyer has to keep you cheap, keep you broke, keep you pissed tied off, up. keep you triggered, yeah. keep you yeah. tied up, all that other stuff. To that point. Uh, one of our major partners is a guy named Rob Kivlik and Kivlaw.ca. Everybody should go to him. He's a defense lawyer. Um, he's our guy. And then we got another guy named Mark Bory, who's like, he's he's it. Like, he's helped write slap law uh, legislation here in Ontario. Like, he knows what he's doing. And if it weren't for those two guys, I bet you I would feel very differently about the job that I do today. Like, I would feel like yeah. I can't go forward and do that job because there's all, and you know this, right? There's always somebody out there that's going to go, you know yeah. what? I'm going to take offense to what you're doing or I don't like you. So I'm going to go tie you up in court with something because you said something about me or I took umbrage or I need money, whatever the situation is. The legal system rarely ever gets the law right. It's more of a strategy that people use to be able to fuck over other human beings. Yeah. We know that. Yeah. It's yeah, it's it's a it's I've been through it too many, and fortunately I've, I've won. I've had to go through it. Like even after all this, so all this lovely 
life of me inheriting a, a strip club. Well, shortly after I had my childhood best friend fucking rob me for half of the deal we were supposed to go through because we're childhood best friends, right? We don't need good contracts. So got screwed. Good life lesson, right? Yeah, Teaches you great learning I experience. Take contracts now. Then yeah. my sister, my my sister who I never grew up with, my half sister, the same dad, different. She sued me and contested the will because my dad did a home kit will. And in BC, you need two witnesses. He only had one. One witness is not good enough for the will. So Jesus she Christ. then... Oh yeah. So I had, and at that point I was so broke, right? My daughter had been born. I, the union hadn't released yet. And I'd sunk all this money into this pipe dream of making the union. And it hadn't, my wife thought it was crazy. You're doing this pot doc and it's making no money. It's draining everything. And your fucking sister suing you. And then I beat my sister. I represent myself in court. I learned how to do affidavits for BC standard and do all that and present the evidence. And I had all the documentation, everything to back what I was saying beat her in court. Well, then she tries to get some fucking thugs to come collect from me because she didn't like that I beat her fair and square in court. Well, thankfully, sister, sister? thankfully, well, it's yeah. not my sister anymore. Yeah, right? I, have to say, just... I am never getting into, I am never fucking you over. If you <laughs> were capable of that, that parallel support system as well, that was there to hopefully guide you through that process. <laughs> yeah. It was, well, it was nice because when that call came in, so that's actually so in the world the underground world there's checks and balances right you come into a town you have to check in to make sure if you're collecting from somebody that you're not collecting from the wrong person that has an uncle that's a member or part of the mafia or severally connected right so my sister had sent out an order to collect from me and it come in and thankfully my dad and i were friends with them so when my name came up they're like who they're like and at this point i started to get my career going the union had just started to release or whatever and then they, you know, they were like, well, they're like, Adam is clean. He's not involved in anything. Why is who's coming to collect from him? Who the fuck is this that's coming to do this? And then they were like, oh, they're like his own relative, his sister. They're like, yeah, this is not a collection. This is a this is a family dispute. Uh, and we're putting a kibosh on this. And I got the call. They're like, hey, Adam, just so you know, your sister tried to get some guys to come and Jesus fuck them from get you. Fucking and I was like, what? I, I started losing it. This one, I was younger and a bit more wild. I was kind of like, I was like, if some motherfucker showed up to my house with my daughter and said that I was like, I, they better be packing because I'll fucking kill these motherfuckers, right? With a bat. <laughs> I was like, you're going to come to my house and threaten me with my kid? What? Right? We're and they're not... like, Adam, Adam, it's all been squashed. It's all handled. And I was like, I was losing it. I was like, you know, you start thinking Papa Bear, protect your kid, right? Yeah. Not that I'm yeah. the most invincible, but you're just... I'm like, you were going to come to my house where my kid is? Like, I was like, I was like, absolutely unacceptable, right? Like, I deliberately stayed on good terms with these people in my life so that that would never happen, right? Like, yeah. mm -hmm. and these Yahoo, but that's why, thankfully, at least these Yahoos check through because sometimes you can get young punks that won't do, they'll just be like, oh, we're, we think we can get some money from this guy. We're going to go sweat this motherfucker. Thankfully, they weren't that and didn't come because it could have gotten things could have got a lot worse, but. All these great stories are why I don't want to, I didn't want to own a strip club, right? Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'd much uh, rather deal with the CBC or dorky, like, arrogant yeah, yeah. now, because I know in my head, even if they one up me in my career or something, I'm like, I could take you in the room and fucking strangle you to death. So I'm not worried about you. Right? Like, <laughs> okay, I'm taking, I'm taking my, my hat out of the ring for our documentary. I'm just going to follow Adam around with a camera. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's what he did. I think he wanted to just set the tone if he does do anything with our documentary just to let you know that who's in charge he might fucking choke you the fuck out if no i just want to i'm gonna make one on him yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah me too yeah girl by the way thank you for your advice the other night we're already because of it we got a couple of things already going um uh, nice. one we didn't even know what a pitch deck was so now there that we go. know that that actually gets us um gets something in front of us and you didn't gets know what a pitch deck of, was i had no idea no, what a pitch deck was i knew what a pitch deck was I had no Thanks idea. For sharing. Adam brought it up. Yeah. I just don't have the time. No, like I said, guys, invoice. I'll send it out next week after <laughs> Christmas. I'll give you guys a Christmas break for, for the consultation. Yeah. But after that, we'll, we'll, the, the tax is coming, right? Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. I thought it. I yeah, the doorbell always. ringing. Yeah. Uh, Adam yeah. Score G, ladies and gentlemen, follow him online. Uh, follow him on Adam. Twitter at Score G. You can see it right there in the Chiron. Uh, Adam, I look forward to the 2 2 doc, the Dolph doc. Uh, love everything you do. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Thank you very Merry much Christmas for taking some time with us today. I really appreciate it. You're my when you're launching stories. the next doc, we'll have you back on so we can help promote it. 
Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys. I yeah. really appreciate yeah. it. Lot, I mean, lot, lots of thanks to you from day one and Dean, you guys always promote my stuff and, and have me on. I like to be able to have a voice where I can have a longer thing. So thank you guys. I appreciate it. And keep doing your grind, man. This is the, the kind of formats and stuff that I think everybody's enjoying now, honest, truthful conversations that are they're down to earth and go through. So thank you for what you guys are doing. I appreciate thanks, you guys. Buddy. Thank you. Adam. Thanks, appreciate man. you. Merry Christmas ahead of the family. We'll talk to you soon. Peace. See you, buddy. Adam Scorgi, documentarian. Good man. I'll just go through some of his very individual. That, yeah, um, that you uh, you may not know about because um, he's done quite a few of them. So the 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 uh, the the pot doc that he was talking about, the first one he did was the union, the business the union, behind yeah. getting high, uh, and then well, the helped change high. the pot laws in Canada. By the way, it that, did that. that, that yeah. It was the start of it. Actually, yeah. they actually played the documentary for people in Parliament. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because of that doc, we have legalization now. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know what? He probably wouldn't admit that, but that's, that's fucking true that, you know what? He, he wouldn't take credit for that, but it's true. Ice mm -hmm. guardians making cocoa, the grand fear story. That was obviously a big one here in Edmonton. We all went to the premiere of that one. A uh, tough guy, the Bob Probert story, man, that was, that is an underrated doc. Like it, it, oh, the that, Proby doc. Yeah. That was fucking, such a powerful so well documentary done. and so worth looking into. If you, if you're a hockey guy, uh, they did such a great job with that one. Talk to the wife. I remember her talking about her husband and, and the noise he used to make when he used to get up early and, ah, oh, just, just heart wrenching, uh, inmate number one, the rise of Danny Trejo, um, put him on the map, I think internationally. Adam is well known as a documentary. That one is worldwide. That one is revered because of Danny Trejo, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. The Bisping doc too. The Bisping doc is a huge Bisping doc is for him. Yeah. Bisping was massive, huge, yeah. massive. It, he kind of slipped in there. There's just a couple. He's involved in, in numerous ones. He did that, Connor. He was part of the team behind it. I don't think his his group his his group did it, but there's a Connor McDavid thing called Whatever It Takes. Um, that he was uh, involved in. He gets called now, like, you know what I mean? Like, he gets Probably called consult. whenever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so, he gets called from guys like Lachlan Cross awesome. on, a, like, a Wednesday <laughs> night. Going, on a Wednesday night. Hammered, <laughs> let's, let's do a documentary. Here's Dean. And I'm like, we're doing this now? Is that what we're doing? I got an idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got an idea for a new computer. Are you free for a call with Bill Gates right now, Dean? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, I'm a bit of a bulldozer. I get things done. I love it. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 yeah that takes. Bisping doc is amazing. Did you hear him slip in there casually? These being sued by the UFC. Yeah. It's got to be that. Yeah, Bisping doc. I don't know. Should have asked him. There's a story more. there. I just seen. That's the thing. Sometimes you get a guy that overshares like he really <laughs> overshared today. Yeah. And you're like, do you push the envelope and say, hey, why is the UFC <laughs> suing you? Because it clearly being sued is like literally worse than a fight for anybody that has a business. So when you get sued, you're like, Oh fuck! Because you got to be a, get a lawyer, and you got to go through the discovery, yeah. and you got to defend yourself, right? So yeah, it's uh, I didn't want to push. Do we want to make it worse? Yeah, yeah, because he just finished talking about how he used to choke guys out and beat up Hell's Angels when he was in fucking university. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not, I can't I'm believe you just didn't know the uh, the uh, the strip club story. No, I, he must have. Yeah, he's he must have been your show. Yeah, he must yeah. have done that years ago on the locker room at some point. But I did know that he. Uh, I I I went to that club. When, when I was in Cologne, cheetahs, a yeah. couple of times, yeah. It was, you know it was there was a cheetahs fun. in Windsor too. Like I think it was a chain. There's a cheetahs in Windsor, and they had a sign up front, or maybe it might have been leopards. Why always with the cats? I don't even know why. No, there was a cheetahs in Windsor. Yeah, was there? Was. Yeah, there's yeah. But it was like, and the the sign, it's like forty hot chicks, one ugly one. <laughs> always. And I was like, I gotta go in. I gotta see if the ugly one's working. <laughs> and sure enough, she was. In fact, all of them were. That yeah, all the ugly ones that were. was like that was the night it was c-section night and i'm not kidding you uh where you walk in and it's like there was a pregnant stripper I have a hard time with the scars yeah. uh yeah yeah in the c-section yeah, yeah. and you're like oh this life's tough huh whatever life's happened to mitzi wow. uh the ping pong ball chick yeah i don't know i don't know legend though dead eye Calgary, with that thing. made dead eye yeah she could literally she could pick someone off running across the strip joint floor how at like 80 she feet. She put him in beer. It's got to be 70. I think oh, she's so using like soft basketballs. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, in my Same 20s, trick. she was in her 30s. She's not that old. She's in her 60s. Mitzi's in her 60s. I think they put a, they put a, uh, there was regulation that, um, that impacted her career. 
<laughs> Shrapnel. Yeah, you're right. Because it, it's not just a ping pong ball that comes out, right? It's all the other stuff. It's like, a, whoosh, like all the STDs attached to it. It's like, it's it's like, like a, a bio of mass destruction. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, boys. Oh, it's good, good to one. see you. It's Hold Christmas. this, Paulie's. Paul, I just noticed Paulie's. <laughs> How long have you been in the green room, Paul? Oh, I don't know for. A little bit there. I was just, I was fascinated by the stories he was uh, telling, like, Scorgy, holy shit, that guy's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, blown away by him. Holy yeah. crap. I know. I, Remind I, me I was... never to cross him. <laughs> no, no, you never want to do it. Uh, Merry Christmas to you, Paul. Hey, Merry Christmas. That's, oh, that's why I thought I'd pop in. Just say Merry Christmas to you fellas, and uh, hope everybody's going to have a happy, healthy, safe holiday, and uh, we're going to do a show 7 a.m. tomorrow because, you know, Friday, and I'm working from home today, so. Festivus Are you doing a show tomorrow? tomorrow? It's a festivist yeah. show tomorrow it, for you. Festivist show, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I might pop in on that one. What time yeah. you show? What time you starting at? Seven a.m. Uh, you go until eight nine. Oh yeah, maybe later because I work from home. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. might pop in a little. Okay, then. Seven. <laughs> seven is a little early uh, for me now. Well, uh, the reason we little... do seven is because you know I start work at eight. And Mondays and Fridays, I usually work from home. I work from home today because there's like there's nobody in the office, so I just everybody's done. Call center, pretty. Everybody's bad. done for the fucking holidays. This is like one yeah. of my favorite times of the year too. Where it's like you got people are like you come in. Like my son today, he had school. He says to me, "Should I? Can I just stay home?" I'm like, "Yeah, totally." Yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fucking. It's like the last two days of school. You remember the last two days of school where it's like we're watching The Wizard of Oz, we're watching yeah. The Lion King. It's <laughs> That's like a, it. Every fucking call. Yeah. The Wizard of Oz was always on every holiday. You knew it was going to be great. You knew the teachers had enough when you went into the gym and they pulled out that fucking rolling television with the VCR. And it's like, yeah. all right, time for the Wizard of Oz, everybody. Because hey, you're in the fucking lounge getting hammered and smoking cigarettes. Yeah. And I remember like seeing the teachers in like the second or third grade stumbling out of the teacher's lounge, smoke yeah. billowing out. And they're like, I'm like, see you later, Mrs. Arsenal. She's like, go fuck yourself. And I'm like, yeah. all right, Christmas yeah. holidays. Christmas. It's Christmas, no. everyone. I, I'm Sorry. so old, guys. I'm so old that in my second, third, fourth, it was I think it was about seventh grade before the VCR was available to public schools. Oh, you had the real, so the real. We had, yeah, the big film, big projectors, yeah. because I'm 54, right? So yeah, you're old as fuck. Yeah, I am old as fuck. Still younger but, than Locke, though. Oh, but yeah. fit as fuck. I remember they brought a computer in for my grade seven class, and um, it was a like a budget rental truck mm. that backed up <laughs> yeah. to the door, yeah. <laughs> and cards. then they had they had like four guys hauling equipment out of it for forty five minutes. Yeah. And they plugged it all in for another forty five minutes, <laughs> and then we all got to play pong. Yes. Yeah. I remember and then the they big screen. Packed yeah. everything back into the butt into the thing and then drove it away. And we went, wow, what was that? The marvels that of technology. Yeah. Right. Someday yeah. you could have one of these in your home. Yeah. 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 Thanks. No. Each no, dude. Yeah, I, this, I love it. This, I love this, this time entire, of year. Yeah. I this love entire how week. Know. This entire week right? in my office has been the, the most overused line has been, let's circle back after the new year. Yeah. Let's yeah. circle back after the new year. I'm doing it's a lot of that out. right now. Yeah. Well, just yeah, you know, yeah. I did that today. I had a meeting with somebody, and we're real quick meeting. We brought someone on, and I'm like, "Great, yeah, good." And then it's like, "What's next steps?" I'm like, "You know what? Next steps aren't going to start till at least the second. So enjoy your holidays. Yeah, yeah like exactly. enjoy your holidays. But this is my favorite time of year. I got all, dude, all my gifts done, wrapped, Same. cards Fuck. done, fucking Same, everything. I Absolutely shopping. I was out this morning. Go Seven. Did you go this morning? Yeah. Uh, no, I was at uh, I was at I was at the grocery store this morning at seven a.m. Ashley and I got up early, track pants and sweaters and bedheads, and we fucked off to the grocery store. We got everything done. We just had to fight the little old Italian ladies for the bread. That was <laughs> yeah. all that was in the store. And then we were back home, done everything by nine thirty this morning. The traffic nice. was already starting to just like cock right up throughout Oof. the entire city. Oof. Yeah. Pulled oh, into dude. the driveway. Did one of these lock the, the door in that car will four not, days. Yeah, the car will not move for another fucking yeah. five days. It's going to be great. Well, we're getting this huge Arctic blast, too. We're going to get a ton of snow over the next yeah. three days, ton of rain, then flash freezing, ton of snow. Everybody's fucking losing their minds. You know what Dean did? Dean loaded up for the next seven days. Smart Dean's man. presents are purchased. Fuck yeah. And and Instacart's delivering me a couple <laughs> odds and ends tomorrow morning. And I'm thankful for the pandemic for that. I really nice. am. Be upset all you want. 
Have a great Christmas, everybody. Locke, Merry Christmas to you. We'll see everybody on the second. Pauly, thanks for stopping in. Great to see you. Uh, True North Eager Beaver tomorrow right here on our network. Uh, A little bite in the morning with you and Douglas. I guess Locke's just peace out. Okay, bye, Locke. (laughs) Merry Christmas, pal. He's just unbelievable. (laughs) What a fucking asshole. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't say Merry Christmas. Uh, Merry Christmas to you, Ryan. The Lins Report. You can get the Lins Report. Download, subscribe. Same with the True North Eager Beaver podcast. It's a great little news slash uh, politics podcast. They go over a whole bunch of stuff. They'll be on the air tomorrow morning. Follow Paul as well at Paulie's World on Twitter. True North Eager Beaver. Subscribe. Follow Ryan at Ryan Lindley on Twitter. Thanks, boys. Merry Thanks, Christmas. Merry see Christmas. you on the Merry second. Christmas, eh? Bye. All right. See you next Talk year. Talk to you soon. You betcha. Now I'll probably see you before next year. See you, Paulie. Great to see you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. That's uh, 600 shows. I think we only missed eight days this year. Seriously. And I'm grateful for all of them. That's the truth. You want what I'm grateful for? To be here. Be able to do content. Talk to people we want to talk to. But you know what I'm really grateful for today? You. You. All of you in the comment section. Hundreds and thousands of downloads of our audio version of the podcast. A few thousand subscribers on YouTube. No big deal. It's fun. I don't care how many people are there. What I care about is you're here. And I'm very grateful for it. That you spend time with us. That you listen to us. You talk to us. You interact with us. You support us. You help us. There is no greater reward than for people to enjoy what you do and for you to appreciate them. We appreciate you. We're grateful for you. All of you. DJ. Cancer Cure, Elaine, Elisa, Leanne, the Sea Witch, Mr. Godius, Mel, Maggie, all of you. If I missed you, I'm sorry, but we love you. We are not here if you're not listening. And we've had a tremendous year. And next year will be bigger, better, happier. And it's because of you. Very grateful, like the most. Incredibly grateful. Have a great Christmas. Enjoy your time with your family. Be of good character. Do acts for the common good. Help others before you help yourself. Be kind. Be loving. Forgive. Be strict with yourself. Extend grace. It's all for you. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. See you in January.